and welcome mindsetters to this session of learn extra live for grade 11 maths literacy i'm ty and i have Haley in today who's been taking us through today's session what are we doing today Haley? hi ty hi grade 11s we're going to be doing some revision okay and like i said earlier i <laughs> can't believe we're already this time of year revision mm. time but it's it should be fun it's so like we're going to go through like a whole lot of different mm. whole lot of different questions kind of yeah. varied ones and if there's anything that they need specifically then they must contact yeah. us okay I'm right so go. you head that way <laughs> mindset is you know the drill you need to get on the page and get chatting to me you know the link www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra talk to me and let me know what you guys are thinking and as i always say i can't read your mind through the tv so you have to post it on the Facebook page so I know what you guys are thinking. And if you're lost in here, if you need help, post, post, post. <laughs> but on that note, make sure you have your pens and pads out and you're going to make some notes because those are essential to studying. If you don't make notes, you probably won't pass. But <laughs> anyway... Moving right along, Haley, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Ty. Our grade eleven's again. Okay, so today we're going to be doing some revision, and I think the best way to do this is to probably just jump in and do some questions, and uh, let's start off with what we got. So the first question that we got is um, some of my grade eleven's absolute favorite. When I tell them that we're doing area of volume, they go, "Oh no, I hate this section." But anyway, we're going to start with volume. So let's find the volume of the cylinder below using the formula. Um, Volume equals power r squared h, and round off your answer to two decimal places. It's always important to read the question carefully so that you know like what they want you to round off to, and go back and reread the question just to check that you've actually answered exactly what they've said and that you've done the rounding, those few little easy marks that you tend to lose. So what do we have? We have our diameter is 6 centimeters, and our height is 21 centimeters. Now, whenever I have a diagram like this, what I like to do is I like to calculate the radius. So my radius radius is my diameter divided by 2, and that's clearly 6 divided by 2, so my radius is 3. And I always put my radius into my picture. And then I've got my height here, so they've asked me to calculate two decimal places. They haven't said in any particular unit, because it's always important to convert first. It's a whole lot easier to convert first, but I'm going to give my answer in centimeters, and Let's go through it. So my volume, I also write out the formula first, pi r squared h, just because then I know what I'm doing. So my pi, now look out for the fact where they say use pi equals 3,14, because if they use that, then that's what you like to, that they like you to use. They're not going to mark you wrong if you use your pi button on your calculator, but just look out for that fact. So it's always better to have the same answer as the teacher's memo. So... We're going to use power on the calculator times by the radius. So we substitute our radius, we said was 3 squared times my height, which was 21. Now, you'll notice that I've left out the centimeters at this point. I always like to put my units in my final answer. I, s I find they sometimes get confusing. So we're going to use our power times 3 squared times by 21 and get an answer. And that is 593,76. 593,76. And really important at this stage to add our units and its volume so it is cubed. So we've got our answer. Double check. We went to the round of the answer to two decimal places. Find the volume. We've got that. Let's move on to the next question. Right. Sophia is traveling at 58 kilometers per hour. How far will she travel in one hour and 43 minutes? This is a ratio question. And I know that ratios sometimes don't seem as simple as they can be. So what do we know? We know, and let's write it out. We know that she's going 58 kilometers in one hour. What we want to know is how far is she going to travel in one hour and 43 minutes? So that's what we want to know. So first of all, we cannot work in hour and minutes. So we need to convert our 43 into hours. And how do we do that? Well, we're going to say that's 43 over 60. So one hour and 43 over 60 is going to give that to me in hours. And what I do now that I've got this in this format, I can see what do I do from here? I'm basically timesing by one hour and 43 over 60. And I need to do the same thing here. 
So I'm basically going to say, well, okay, I've got 58, and I'm going to times it by one hour and 43 over 60. So with my calculator, I'm going to first work out my 43 divided by 60 and get an answer. And I'm going to add one. Hey, then I'm going to see, well, okay, that answer times by 58 is going to give me 99,57 or 99. So basically 100. Let's round that off. Um, let's leave it as two decimal places. 99,57 kilometers. Now, my question to you is always, does the answer make sense? We're expecting an answer that's bigger than 58 or smaller than 58. Um, because she's traveling for longer than an hour, we're expecting an answer that's bigger. So does 100 kilometers make sense? It kind of does. She's traveling for nearly two hours. And with 50, 58, kind of like nearly, nearly 50, so I'm expecting about 100. So my answer makes perfect sense. And there you go. I've got the answer. Let's move on. Right, so the next question, I feel like I'm like rushing through all of these and I'm like touching a little bit on everything. <laughs> but I hope that you guys are actually following. And if there are any specific problems, then you need to let us know so that we can focus our revision more on that. But we've got 30 children were asked to describe the color of their eyes. The results are shown in the pictogram below. Now, where's our pictogram? Okay, so our pictogram, first of all, our pictogram has a key. So we've got a key for every one little drawing, it's two people. And for half a drawing, half a person is one person. So we clearly need the key to actually answer the pictogram. So we've got blue, we've got gray, brown, green's a question mark, and other. I wonder what a color other is. What would you say other is? <laughs> we've got blue, gray, brown, <laughs> green. <laughs> Not sure what other is. Mm. Ty's going to think about that. I'll think about Let's that see. one. <laughs> the question is, how many children had brown eyes? So we go to our brown. We count how many little people we had. So we've got one, two, three, four full ones. So we've got four times two. Oh, I know one. Plus one half. Okay, Ty's got a color eye for us. Let's Probably go hazel. Hazel. Perfect. Mm. That's great. I'm glad we did <laughs> that sort of. Okay. So four times two plus one is nine. So we see that they're nine children. Now, guys, another thing I want to mention as I'm doing this calculation in my head. Um, try to use your calculator. You've got a calculator with you, so use your calculator. Because I find that the kids that I teach, they tend to think, no, they can actually do this in their heads. And I'm not saying that they can't, but I know that exam pressure does funny things to the mind, and we do silly things that we can't account for. So use your calculator because you have it. So use it as a tool. Right, how many children have green eyes? Well, that was a good question. So our green eyes was a question mark. What do we know is that there were 30 children in total. So let's go back to our pictogram and let's calculate how many for each one. So blue we had two and then we got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Is that twelve? So we've got twelve with grey eyes. We've calculated that as nine and we've got four there. So the remainder have green eyes. So what we need to do is add this up. And like I said, I'm going to use the calculator now. So we had 2 plus 12 plus 9 plus 4. So we see that there were 27 in total. There were 27 excluding the green eyes. So now for our green eyes, we've got 30 minus our 27. And we can see that that's 3 that have green eyes. So let's go back and write in our picture. So how many children? There are three there. And show all your working. If you're going to do these kind of drawings in your question paper, and you're going to write it on your question paper, just make sure that when your examiner's marking it, that they see more than just the answer. So show how you've actually calculated. So even if you just say 30 minus 27, you would have got all the marks. Kind of the method marks that is important to remember. Hey, we've got another graph. The graph shows the temperature of a substance over a period of five hours. What is the range of temperature shown? So first of all, we need to work out what is the range. So our range 
is our highest amount minus our lowest amount. So that is our range. Now we're dealing with something that happens over five hours. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the beginning is our lowest and the end is our highest or vice versa. So we need to kind of take a ruler and I'm actually going to do that with a line. I'm going to draw a line here. Right. And I'm going to move this line up and down to see which is the highest point and which is the lowest point. So I'm going to move it and see my highest point is there. And now I need to read that off the graph. Okay. It's not moving down much. Right, so my highest point is there, and it's between 50 and 55. Now, you will have a little bit of leeway between these, these amounts. So you will be able to... Um, especially with a graph of this size. So we won't accept 50 as an answer, and we definitely won't accept 55 as an answer. But any answer in between, we would probably accept, but I'm going to go with it's about halfway. So my highest point is 52,5. Okay, that's my temperature. And my lowest point, I'm going to take my, carry on with my line, and I'm going to draw this going down, and see what do I see here? My lowest point is actually on the 40. So my lowest point was 40. So it says, what is the range of temperature shown? So we're clearly going to say our temperature was 52,5 was our highest, minus 40 is our lowest. So our range, and we get our calculator out, 52,5 minus 40 and we see that our range was 12,5. So our range was 12,5 degrees. We're dealing with temperature in degrees. It hasn't told us whether it's degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit, so I'm just going to leave it as degrees. And if you don't know, you could have just written out the word degrees because we did degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, kind of the same, the same degrees. No, not the, sa not the same thing, <laughs> okay? But you need to give us our unit. So I would have said degrees, just to save the problem. Okay, have we answered the question? The graph shows the temperature. What is the range of the temperature shown? We have given that answer. Perfect. Let's move on. In a game show, a contestant must throw two dice at the same time. In order to win 15,000 Rand, the contestant must throw at least one even number. That means one of the dice must land on an even number. So one of the dice must either be a two, a four, or a six. The sum of the numbers must also be a multiple of three. So how many possible winning combinations are there? Now, this is quite an involved question because we're looking at two things. We're looking at one, we need to have an even number, and we also need to have a multiple of three. So our multiple of three, what are our multiple of three? Let's start with that. Our multiple of three are basically three, six, nine, and 12. I don't need to go further because on two dice, the maximum I can get is six times six. And now what I need to do is find all the winning combinations. Now, we could do this in a number of different ways. We could may may maybe we could draw a tree diagram of this, maybe a contingen contingency table of this. Um, so let's actually do this as a contingency table. So I'm going to draw this, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time doing this contingency table just to get all the possible outcomes. So I have, um, let's, right, I have my first ask. I'm going to try to draw this it's this way. Okay. Um, I think I need more. Right. My first can be a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. Right. My second ass can be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. I think I needed these green lines to be just a little bit longer. Maybe needed a little bit more space. Okay, I can move this up a little bit. Okay. And let's do yellow lines going across. So, okay, we needed them to add up to a multiple of three. So, if I'm thinking about adding these, one plus one is two. 
So this here is going to be a two. That is no good for us. That doesn't work. Our multiples of three are two and one, so that would work, and one and two. That would work. Okay. So are at least one of them even? Yes. So that definitely works. So we're going to tick this twice. So can you see and you follow my train of thought of what I'm actually doing? I'm not entering the numbers, but I'm just going to go through the numbers. 3 plus 1 is not a multiple of 3. 4 plus 1, but 5 plus 1 is. Now, 5 plus 1 is a multiple of 3, but neither of these is actually an even number. So 1 and 5 doesn't work, and clearly 5 and 1 won't work. Okay, so those didn't work. So this we're going to actually change to a cross. Well, let's we'll cross it out like that. Right, six and one doesn't work. So what we need to do is find all the multiples of three like this. So I'm going to go through them. Five and one, okay, four and two does work. It's a multiple. Plus, it is both even. And clearly, four, two and four is the same thing. And then three and three is a multiple, when we add them up we get 6, but they are neither of them are even. So carrying on with that, the next one that we've actually got is 6 and 3. Okay? That is a multiple, but it is not even. Uh, sorry, it is even. No, let's delete that. Okay, So 6 and 3 is a multiple and it is even. We've got 5 and 4 is a multiple and is at least one of them is even. 4 and 5 is the same thing and 6 and 3 is the same thing. And finally, we've got our 6 and 6 where they're multiple because they add up to 12 and they're even. So now we can count how many of those there are. So does that all make sense? So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we've got 9 total combinations. We could actually write out those combinations. If you wanted to, it's 2 and 1, 1 and 2, um, and we can carry on with that. So we've got how many possible winning combinations are there? There are nine possible winning, com winning combinations. Okay. What is the probability that the contestant will win 15,000 Rand? Well, clearly, there were nine possible winning combinations out of a total of, if we look at all of these together, there were 36 outcomes altogether. Eh? And that gives us our outcome. We can do that as a simplif we can simplify that. 9 divided by 36 is a quarter or 25%. So we can write it as a quarter, or remember we can write this as a percentage, so we get 25%. And that's not a bad probability, actually. Hmm, of winning are actually not that bad. 25% is not too Better bad than one. For, 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 winning, for winning this. 15,000 Rand, I need to find out where this <laughs> is. <laughs> I'm exactly. I'm like, hey, I've got a quarter of a chance to make it. Oh, I've got a perfect chance. I'm going to try this <laughs> out. Okay. Um, what do you say we take a bit of a break? I think so too. Mm. Ah, All right, mindsetters, so. you need to get on the page and let me know what you guys are thinking. Post, 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 post. I'm just loving what's happening on the page. You guys are talking, talking, talking. But besides you just telling us that you're doing the show, Tell us if there's anything wrong that you need help with so we can cover it. But on that note, Mindsetters, we'll see you after this break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break there. You went to do whatever you had to do. You're back, you're ready, you're good to go, and you're going to be making notes, as I always say. I just want to say thank you to Musa for posting. Hey, how you doing, Musa? Yes. But on that note, this is where I hand over to Haley. who's going to continue the show. Haley, take it away. Thanks, Ty. I agree, I feel like I'm going through at like this like rapid rate, and I'm not sure why. So I'm going to try and slow down a little bit. And I think I just want to get through the questions because I've got so many nice questions to actually show you and share with you. But I know I don't have to do it all in this hour. So let's start with question five, and let's take it a little bit slower. So we've got the train. I love this question about the train. Okay, we've got Iona, Lisa, Lauren, and Dom are on a road trip around the country. They are approaching a railway crossing, and Lisa is driving. The lights on the warning sign start flashing, which means that a train is approaching. So Lisa 
is traveling at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. Convert the speed into meters per second. So we need to do two things. We need to first convert our kilometers into meters, and then we're going to convert our hours into seconds, and then we're going to divide the two. So let's do that. So first of all, kilometers into meters. Now, um, what I always like to do is think how many kilometers in a meter? There are a thousand kilometers. A thousand, no, not a thousand kilometers, a thousand meters in a kilometer. Right, we've got a thousand meters, and that's not going to work. A thousand meters in a kilometer. We are going from kilometers to meters. So we are going from this one basically to a thousand. So we're going to be timesing. So we're going to take our 90, we're going to take our 90, and we're going to times it by a thousand to get meters. And clearly that is 90,000 meters. Right. Then we're going to convert our hours into seconds. So we've got one hour is equal to, well, how many seconds? Again, we're going from one, we're going to be multiplying because we're going to a bigger number. We've got 60 minutes and 60 seconds. So let us change that. Let's move that out the way for a sec. 60 times 60 is 3,600 seconds. We're going from a big small number to a big number, so we're going to be multiplying. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Let's change our color. Okay, so we've got one hour. In actual fact, we don't need to do anything because we've got one hour. So one hour is equal to 3,600 seconds. And now what we need to do is we need to convert the two. So we're going to take a different color to do that. We're going to take our 90,000 meters and divide it by 3,600 seconds. And that's going to give us our answer in meters per second. Now that we clearly need the calculator for. So our calculator, you can use your fraction button if you like. 90,000, just double check as you're entering numbers onto your calculator that you're actually entering what you intend to enter. So 90,000 divided by 3,600 and we get an answer of 25. So that is 25, and don't forget your units, meters per second. And what's nice about these kind of questions, where you're dealing with a ratio or a rate like this, is your rate, your actual unit tells you so much. Your unit tells you this meters per second, or the kilometers per hour. Let's go back to my kilometers per hour or my meters per second. They tell me what I need to do. They tell me that I need to take my kilometers and divide it by the hours or my meters and divide it by my seconds. So they actually help me out because if you can read them properly, they tell you what you need to do. So I love these kind of units. Have we answered the question correctly? So at least it's traveling at a speed, convert the speed into meters per second. We've done that, 25 meters per second. Right, let's see what else Lisa is up to. She slams on the brakes while the car is still 70 meters from the train track. Using the following equation, calculate how far away from the track they stopped and the speed is in meters per second. And clearly that's why we did our calculation in our earlier sum. So our stopping distance, Whenever you get a formula that you haven't seen before, don't stress about it. Just substitute values like we know we can. So they tell us our speed is in meters per second. We've calculated that as 25 meters per second. So we know that. And then divide it by 12. So let's substitute that into our formula. So we're going to say 25 squared. And I'm going to leave off the units now and put in units right at the end and divide it by 12, and let's get our answer. So we got 25 squared divided by 12, and we see that our answer is 52,08. 52,08, and what is that? That is our stopping distance, so meters. Have they stopped in time? So she slams the brake, she's 70 meters from the trailway track. Using the following equation, calculate how far away from the track they stopped. 
So we don't know how far they stopped. We were 70 from the track, 70 meters from the track, and it took them 52,08 meters to stop. So how far away were they? Is we're going to take that answer, 70 minus that answer, and we get 17,91, or 17,92. So she had 17,92 meters. And can you see how rereading the question is so important? Because we could have thought that was our answer, 52,08 meters. But that's not what they asked us. They wanted to know how far away they were from the track. So that's what get into the habit of rereading the question. I know it's the most frustrating thing for me because I see it with the kids that I teach all the time. They read a question and they I know exactly what to do. And then they hurry off and they go and they quickly do it and then go on to the next question. Mm. I say to them, just go back. It takes two seconds to just go back and reread because there's so many like little crucial marks mm -hmm. that you would move. So I would have lost, had I not reread that question, I would have lost probably two marks. So, and we had done the calculation perfectly. That's what's and so frustrating. Like, oh. <laughs> you just, just sit there and you're like face palm. Poof. Absolutely. Why? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we've done that calculation. Let's see what else they have to do with this train. Right, the train is a long one. They see this, and to keep themselves occupied, they decide to work out the speed of the train. Their first step is to count the carriages. They get the following answers. So our owner counts 124 carriages. Lisa counts 128 carriages. Lauren counts 120, and Dom counts 128 carriages. Clearly, when you're counting that many carriages, it's not that easy. And that's why we've got four totally different numbers. But now we want to know the mean or the average. So how do we work out average? Let's revise. What is our average? Average is we add up all the values and we divide by how many. So there were four of them. So we're going to say, well, 124 plus Lisa's 128 plus Lauren's 120 plus Dom's 128, and we're going to divide it by 4. Now, show your calculations, show your working, but I want you to show the total for adding that up. So let's do that. That's 124 plus 128 plus 120 plus 128. I want you to show that value, that 500. That's really, really important because this is where your marks will be allocated. 500 divided by 4. If you've made a mistake in adding these, and say you ended up with 498, then you can still end up with a mark for dividing by 4, and you can still end up with a correct mark for actually getting the answer, which is, which is how we get our method marks, which is really, really crucial. So divide by 4 is 125. So our answer here is 125. So always, always, always show your working. Always. My, uh, I've got a child. I can actually tear my hair out because he just gives me the answer. And, and if the answer's don't. right, if the answer's right, it's great because you're going to get these, how many marks was it? Three marks. You'll get all three marks if your answer's right. But if your answer's wrong, and it's so easy to make a silly calculation. Yeah, you can salvage two marks. Absolutely. So easy to make a silly calculation error in adding these up. Okay, let's go back to this. We need the median average. So the median is our middle number. So remember, median is middle. We need to first put these numbers in order. So let's change our color. I'm really missing my pink. Okay, I'm going to go the smallest was 120. Our next value was 124, and then we had 128 and 128. So my median is the middle value, and once I've put them into order, and I can go from highest to lowest or lowest to highest, really doesn't matter. So my answer to that is in the middle of those two numbers. So what I need to do is I need to add them up. So I'm going to say 124 plus 128 and divided by 2. 
and now it's important that you remember about bard mass. The answer that you get must be in the center of those two numbers. So let me show you what you guys tend to do. I'm not saying, just generalizing. So we say 124 plus 128. Press your equals button and then divide it by two. And it should get 126. So my answer here is 126. Let's write it in there. But what you tend to do, well, not all of you, I'm sure, but just think about it. We say 124 plus 128 divided by 2, and we get an answer of 188, and we go, well, it must be 188 because the calculator says so. And this is my pet hate mm. because it's not 188 because 188 doesn't fit between these two numbers. So your calculator says so because you made a clearly a mistake with bod mass and your calculator divided before it added because bod mass does that so if you want to you can put brackets in uh, brackets will work or type in equals or use your fraction button but this is where practice is so important practice these and you won't make that kind of mistake so let's carry on I'll get rid of my pet hate. And the mode is, the modal average is the one that occurs the most. And clearly, we only had four values, and it was quite easy to see that our mode was 128. So was the one that occurred the most. Now, while I'm discussing mode, had we had a different number, then there would have been no mode, and that is an answer. So we don't always have to have, the mode doesn't always have to be one number, and it can be more than one number, and it can be no number. So it's important to note. You know, every now and again, uh, as teachers or examiners, we get these like, I don't know, funny numbers. You mm. know, uh, and not everything is perfect, and especially in real life. And I mean, what are we dealing with in maths lit at the end of the day? We're dealing with real life. So numbers can be messy. So no mode is an answer, but we do have an answer for this one. Let's see what else we do with the train. Right. They estimate that each carriage is approximately 12 meters long and that the two locomotives, one at the front and one at the back, are each 25 meters long. How long is the train in total if they agree there are 128 carriages? So why did they agree there were 128 carriages? I think that they agreed because there were only four of them that were counting, and clearly two of them got the same number. So they agreed that that was the amount of carriages. Now, we want our answer in meters. So easier to convert first, but have we got our answers? Our answers are in meters already. So what do we have? We have the following, and I like to draw little pictures. We've got 25 meters in the front. Okay. Then we've got 128 of these carriages. Okay. How's my picture? And these carriages, they estimate they are 12 meters each. And then at the back, we've got another carriage of 25 meters. So clearly, we need to work that out. So we're going to say 128 carriages times 12 meters plus this 2 times 25. And we can get an answer to that. We can do this on our calculator straight. So we've got 128 times by 12 plus 2 times by 25, and we get 1586. 1586 meters. And the question said, give your answer in meters. What is the total length of the train? And I think we've got the total length of the train. Now, the next part says, convert your answer in question 5.3.2 into kilometers. So we had 1586 meters, and now we're converting to kilometers. So there are a thousand meters in a kilometer. And in this case, let me draw, draw, draw that up again, just in case. Right, we got one kilometer is a thousand meters. We're going from a big number to a small number, so we're going to divide by a thousand. So what is our answer then? It's 1,586 kilometers. And we probably could round that off to two decimal places, so 1,59 kilometers. 
So we've converted into kilometers. I like to, whenever I'm doing a conversion calculation, I always like to leave it as three decimal places. Because I think it makes sense to say 1.586 kilometers. Um, but if you want to actually go with what it says in the front of your exam books, it'll always say two decimal places, so we can say 1.59 kilometers. Okay, because it doesn't tell us what we need to round to. So I think we've still got another question about the train. No, we don't have any more questions about the train. I think it might be time to take a little bit of a break. What do you say, Ty? I think so, too. <laughs> Just scanning through the page here. Guys, keep talking on the page, keep posting. And I want to stress again, make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend to tell another friend to tell their friends to tell <laughs> their <laughs> friends to get on the page and get talking to us. But for now, in fact, yeah, while we take this break, you need to go do that. We're going to see you after this. And welcome back, Mindsetters. I want to say thank you to Musa. You're obviously sticking around with us and you've been posting, 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 and I'm loving it. Thank you so much for, for staying with us and answering those questions. But yes, Mindsetters, I keep saying, make sure you get the word out. Tell your friends to tell other friends to tell other friends so we can get those numbers up so we can get to the 20,000 party, you know, party, party, we do a little duggy. Anyway, moving right <laughs> along, <laughs> we have a lesson to do. So I'm going to hand it over to Haley. Haley, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Ty. I'm also looking forward to that party. So come on, guys, tell everybody. Okay. Um, let's carry on with the next question. So we're going to go to question six. So at least that did take a little bit more time with the last question. Um, this is now related to cricket. Cricket, um, one of my great hobbies. I love watching cricket. And in actual fact, um, but don't tune away, I believe that South Africa is playing sometime today. So hopefully, uh, go boys. Um, okay. Having said that, let's carry on with the question. Right, so we've got cricket, and we're dealing with many sports fixtures are played at night and are also televised. So that's important because me sitting at home, I need to watch my cricket, so I'm glad that it's televised. As a result, sports fields have to use bright floodlights, and the intensity of the lights that is emitted by floodlights is measured in lumens. The number of floodlights required depends on the area in meters squared of the sports field. Now. I know most of you are going to be thinking, well, okay, I don't do science, and I have no idea what a lumen is. But you know what? These are words that you might come across, you might never see again, but we're going to deal with it. And that's what I, is so important. I want you to like, take a deep breath when you see something you've never seen before and think, you know what? I've got all these skills. I can do it. So even though we don't really know what a lumen is, we're going to deal with it. You just work so around it. Let's, we, get, we, we are, we're going to have to deal. So the minimum lumen requirement for a sports field where televised events are held is 1,400 lumens per meter squared. So now that gives me a little bit more details. I don't know what this lumen is. I don't know how it's measured, but I know that I need 1,400 of them per meter squared if there's going to be television. One floodlight flood flood light emits 220 thousand lumens. So now I know a little bit more information that I know that the floodlight has gives me a lot of lumens and I only need 1400 per meter squared. So let's read the question and see what else we're going to discover. It says use the formula given below to calculate how many floodlights will be required for an area of 500 and is a sorry 5500 meter squared. Now, show your calculations. They're giving us the formula. So now all our panic about not knowing what a lumen is, and hey, they've given us the formula, which is really great. So we've got our number of lights, which is what we are calculating. We want to know how many flood lights. That's my question mark. Is the area of the field times 1,400, because that was per meter squared, we needed 1,400, divided by 220,000, and the reason for that is because that's how much one flat light gives me. But they've given me the formulas, and even if I can't understand the formula, I can still use it. So what do I know? Let's write out what I know. I've got the number of lights, is my question mark. My area of the field has been given to me, is 5,500. So show all our calculations. So we're going to say the number of lights, the number, okay, the number of lights, and you don't have to write this all out, is equal to my area of my field is 5,500 times by my 1,400, which is given to me, 
divided by 220,000. So panic about these lumens, and look how easy that is. I've got a calculator. I can use my fraction button on my calculator, my area of my field, times 1,400, divided by 220,000. Just make sure that you've entered the right number of zeros and double check. And, and, and if you think that you've made a mistake, you know you can count the zeros. Otherwise, do the calculation a second time. So what is our answer? We need 35 li floodlights. So this we need 35 lights. That seems like quite a lot of floodlights. So maybe we should go double check that. So we had our area times by 1400 and divide that by 220, one, two, three. Just checking, again we get 35. So clearly 35 is the right answer. Let's move on to the next part of the question. The graph below represents the relationship between the area required so we've got a relationship between the area required to be lit by the floodlights and the number of lights needed. So we've got a relationship between the area required and the number of lights. So I like to always read a graph very carefully. I've got floodlight requirements for the television sp for televised sports. Number of floodlights okay, is along my y-axis, and the size of the sports field in meters squared is along my x-axis. And clearly, it starts at zero, and it is a straight line. So now we need to use this information to answer our questions. Identify the independent and dependent variables. So now we've got independent, OK, is always your x-axis. Independent. And your y-axis is always dependent. And this is something that you need to remember. But now let's think about it this way. Our independent is what I can change. My dependent then depends on it. Now, if I change the size of the field, I'm going to have to change the number of globes, the number of floodlights. That means my size of my field is my independent. If I've got a small field, Clearly, I'm going to need less floodlights. But if I've got a bigger field, I'm going to need more floodlights. The lights is not dependent on, is not independent. Can't change the amount of lights as I wish. So my independent is my size. So size is independent. And my dependent is the number of floodlights. is the dependent. So ask yourself, what happens as I change one and which I change? So otherwise, you can learn that. Explain why the graph grows through the origin. So why does it go through the origin? Well, clearly, let's think about what the origin means. If I've got zero meters squared, what does that mean? It means I've got no field. I've got no area on the field, which means I don't have a field. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have a field, then clearly I don't need any lights. That would make sense. That would make <laughs> sense. It would make total sense. So it makes sense of what does the graph mean. So it goes through the origin because if I've got no meter squared, there's no field. And if I've got no field, therefore I need no lights. That's quite a nice, interesting question. And it's the kind of question that comes up every now and again. They always ask you. They, do, they, t they tend to do it when it comes to cost. You know, like if I'm trying to sell, uh, what should we sell? Tickets to a concert. Uh, Ty's having a concert. We're going to sell tickets. Awesome. Um, <laughs> if it goes, uh, is that going to go through the zero? Because if I sell no tickets, I'm going to make no money. So it's always interesting and that's the one they often give us. Let's do the next part of the question. Explain why the graph is a straight line. Right, it is a straight line because it is increasing at a constant rate. There's a constant rate which we calculated. The number of lights that we need is a constant rate. So our straight line is always because there's a constant rate. That was the rate 
at which we needed to increase our globes, okay, those lumens and all the things that we need to do. But if you write in it as a constant rate, you will get your marks for that. So it's increasing at a constant rate. So the more area we need, the more lumens, but I mean, the more floodlights, but it's constant. Write down the equation of the graph. Well, what is our equation of the graph? First of all, we've got the number of lights is going to be equal to my meter squared. Okay, and now I'm going to have to work out my rate of this. And my rate is clearly what I've actually calculated before. So we've used that calculation before was, um, let's go back to that question. Where was that? The number of lights is the area of the field times by this constant rate. That's going to give me the equation of the graph. And what we can do is double check that our answer here was correct. So that is our equation for our graph. It was our meter squared times by our 1400 and divided by this 2200. And we can go and check if our graph, which was 550, was 35. So let's do that quickly. Let's draw a line up from was 5,500, which is about halfway there. Draw it across, and I'm going to draw a line across, and we see that it is about what we had, it was about 35. So I think that that's probably right. Do you think I've got time to do another question, huh? I think mm, I've got, got about another three minutes or so, so. Time to do maybe, maybe, a, uh, maybe let's start on the next question. Then we can always pick up from here next week when do more revision. Hmm. So let's, All right, let's, let's get into this one. Let's do then. a little bit. So, Tilani and Jeff have a taxi business which transport passengers between Ivory Park and Randburg. The cost of running the bus for each single trip is 120 Rand. Oh, now, I'm okay. Let's get a color pen out. The fare for each passenger is 20 Rand, and the bus can only take 15 passengers. So write down an equation which shows the relationship between the profit and the number of passengers. Well, clearly, number of passengers, the more passengers, the more profit we're going to make. So our profit, well, we can actually use the letter P, is equal to the number of passengers times how much is it costing them? It's each passenger is paying 20 rand times 20 and to a maximum of 15. So we can actually n is at a maximum of 15 because we can have a maximum of 15 people. I feel like I'm being rushed, so I'm going to possibly no, I'm, I'm not being rushed. Right, let's see if we got the complete the table below now. But our profit also we had to take into account, okay. What was our profit? Was our income minus our expense. So we've got to take that, and we actually got to take away our expense. So that's what we can earn, but we've got to minus our 120 rand that it costs for a single trip. So let's do this, complete the table below. If there are no passengers, we've got a negative value. Our profit is negative, which means negative Profit is actually a loss. And we've got 120 because it cost us 120 Rand for the single trip. So that's why it's negative. If there were two passengers, let's do this calculation. So we've got two passengers and they each paid 20 Rand. That gives us 40. And now we had 120 minus 40. No, in fact, 40 minus 120. <coughs> and that gives us. 80, so we've got minus 80. <coughs> For eight passengers, we're going to do the same thing. Eight times 20 equals to 160 minus 120. We now have a profit of 40 Rand. For 10 people, we have a profit of 80 Rand. 12, we're going to do the same thing. 12 times 20 is 240 minus 120, so we've got 120. 
and 15 times 20 is 300 is 280. I think I'm going to get this calculation. Just the last calculation, so it was 15 times 20 equals minus 120 is 180. Did I get that calculation correct? 180. How did I write that incorrectly? So let's change this around. This is 180. And I think that that's where I'm going to have to leave you with that question. And I'm going to say goodbye. Hand over to Ty. I'll see you again soon. All right. <coughs> Ready to come to the end of another session. It was so quick. But I want to just say, mindsetters, keep on using the page. Keep chatting to me. Keep letting me know what you guys are thinking. And on top of that, as I say, even when we're not on, just talk to each other on the page for, you, for your guys' own benefit. That's why the page is there. It's for you guys to communicate. If you see a mindset in trouble, help them out. I want to say again, thank you to Musa for helping out Percy there. Percy, I see your post. <coughs> but this is where I sign off and say thank you and see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>